Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hello. And back for the second time in three weeks is uh, my good friend John Gehring of uh, 89.1 The Point here to talk about the Cleveland Browns. Welcome back to the show, John. Thanks, John. Looking forward to uh, a lively discussion this evening, I hope. Yeah, so obviously uh, the big the big talking points coming out of last uh, the last game between these two teams just uh, just two weeks ago. Not so much to do with the game, but more so what happened at the very end. And obviously now we all know uh, the messy situation at the end, the second to last play of the game where um, Mason Rudolph was hit by Miles Garrett and the two, the two of them got in a scrum that involved uh, Miles Garrett removing Mason Rudolph's helmet and then swinging it and hitting him in the head with it. Uh, that violent scrum resulted in the suspension of Miles Garrett Steelers center Marquise Pouncey and uh, Browns defensive lineman Larry Ogunjobi uh, on top of fines to Steelers quarterback Mason Rudolph and fines to a laundry list of other players. I think it was something like 33 players in total were fined on top of the fact that both teams were fined. uh, I think it was $250,000 each. It was a million. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a hefty amount and both teams both teams paid the price, and uh, it was really just a black eye on the NFL. And uh, John, I just uh, I know that we talked about it a little bit, but I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on everything that happened. Well, <laughs> a black eye on the NFL is a, is a good way to describe it, and on the Cleveland Browns, just a very, very out of control situation that should have never happened, especially late in a game. And I, I know. A lot of Browns fans are are faulting Mason Rudolph for the whole situation. I don't think he's faultless, but I do believe that his actions more portrayed what normally goes on on a football field, and Miles Garrett's certainly did not. That was one of the most barbaric and inhumane things that I've ever seen. And while Rudolph definitely wasn't faultless whether there was a racial slur or not or, or whatever happened it certainly didn't look like uh didn't look like he has no blame in the situation but uh did nothing excuses miles garrett's actions i mean that's that's not about football anymore that's just about life i mean that was downright criminal and and there are very few people who are really having an easy time trying to defend Garrett's action. And that's uh, that really just was the thing that you said, is that it kind of took it that extra step where it was no longer about football. Uh, but luckily for all sides involved, uh, Rudolph was not critically injured, at least not physically. Uh, you know, we could have a long discussion, the three of us, about Rudolph's play over the past uh, couple weeks about how maybe his mental game has deteriorated and uh, it's you know spread into his performance on the field. And I guess that'll be kind of the first talking point uh, on top of the fact that Marquise Pouncey won't be playing and neither will Miles Garrett due to their respective uh, suspensions. The Steelers have undergone a quarterback change since this most recent game just two weeks ago. Devil and Duck Hodges is in at quarterback while Mason Rudolph is out. Rudolph has thrown five interceptions to no touchdowns in the last two games. And the Steelers offense was sputtering against the Bengals, putting up just three points through uh, first half and a drive. And uh, Duck Hodges comes in and the Steelers are able to put up uh, a touchdown right away. And it led to a 16 to 10 victory over the Bengals. So it wasn't pretty, but the Steelers got the win last week. And now uh, the Browns, although they wanted their shot at Mason Rudolph again, they're going to be getting Devlin Hodges starting at quarterback. So from the Browns perspective, uh, is there anything that's changing here for them on defense with a new quarterback, or do you have any thoughts on the fact that Rudolph won't be playing in this matchup? I don't think they're going to mind seeing uh, Hodges. Certainly, he is a he has a capability. We saw in the, the Chargers game, he played pretty well in that game. Uh, all things considered, he's more of that game manager style, and I'm sure 
you guys would agree with that. But he's he's definitely formidable quarterback, and um, the Browns not not taking anything for granted with him playing. I think what's what really hurt Rudolph was more missing Smith Schuster and, and James Conner and those weapons that helped spread out the field for him because these last couple of weeks, yeah, I saw part of that Bengals game. That was really, really ugly. Regardless, the Steelers are going to struggle without their, their two biggest weapons, and they're going to have to find some other way to put up points. But from the Browns' perspective, of course, now without Garrett, that, that certainly uh, has an impact, and potentially without Vernon as well. We'll see about that. But um, I don't think the Browns' the strategy changes much with Hodges on the field as opposed to Rudolph. I certainly don't mind as a fan because Rudolph scares me a little bit more, to be honest. <coughs> Excuse me. Honestly, honestly, I'm surprised by that because uh, Rudolph has been like kind of missing throws as a late um, yes. being more uh, thinking about what he's doing and, and stuff and uh, switch to Devlin Hodges is almost better last week and I feel like with Mason Rudolph you're prepared because teams were just challenging uh, were stacking against the run and challenging him to throw uh, prior to that and now with uh, Devlin Hodges you, you don't know what you got for the most part he for the most part he doesn't look that great he hasn't done amazing he's, he was enough to win in the uh in the Chargers game, but that was heavily relied on James Conner. He obviously had the 79-yard touchdown last week. But I am surprised to, uh, to hear uh, you would rather verse um, Rudolph than Hodges when you guys did so well against Hodges, uh, did so well against Rudolph two weeks ago. They did phenomenally against Rudolph, and I think that was a special effort from that defense. Um, that oh, Schober, unfortunately, man. I love yeah, Schober. Schober uh, <laughs> And even Burnett in that game played. Sorry, guys. I know you're not the biggest Burnett fans, but he played phenomenally in that game. That was a special effort from the defense. Um, I understand your point. However, I think uh, Hodges, to me, doesn't seem as explosive. Yeah, that big uh, what eighty yard touchdown pass last week, but but he doesn't seem to have the same uh, big play capability as Mason Rudolph, and that's what scares me about Rudolph, especially against the Browns defense where the back end is more vulnerable um, from what we've seen so far this season. Hodges just taking what the defense gives to him, uh, being content with some check down throws, as he should be. But that, to me, is is uh, a little bit easier on this Browns defense having the potential to give up some big plays. Now, uh, let me uh, let me ask you, Austin, because I think there's two key differences between Hodges and Rudolph right now. I think the first thing that we'll note is that he's not, you know, he's not going to set the world on fire. I wouldn't even say that he's even close to as elusive as Baker Mayfield is, but he has the legs to buy some time in the pocket, and that's something that Mason Rudolph does not have. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, what was the question, though? I missed that. I was going to say um, uh, there there were two key differences between Hodges and Rudolph, and I'd say that that was one, and then the other would probably be just the mental approach right now. Hodges seems fearless while, like you said, when Rudolph is kind of overthinking things, that's when he seems to fall into a pattern of mistakes. Yeah, for sure, and that's why the, the change was made. I mean, uh, Rudolph was unconfident uh, when throwing to Deontay Johnson when he was pretty open last game against the Bengals that's probably what uh made him get benched and now you have Hodges who is just like well if anything I gotta go out here and prove what I can do I'm an undrafted guy that's gotta try and fight for this job and uh he didn't have that fear he didn't have that like uh oh let me let me hold on to the ball for too long and he has a little bit better feel for pressure in the pocket uh than Rudolph was and Rudolph has been sliding into pressure so it definitely is uh uh there's definitely a difference I don't know if it's better or, or not with uh, with Hodges with what Hodges is not good at, but because uh, I feel like Hodges is more prone to turnovers. But I mean, we saw what happened last time against the Browns. Mason Rudolph was was a mess against against the Browns last time with, with his uh, turnovers. So I mean, can it be much worse than that this time? I I don't think so. So basically, John, the point we're trying to get across is the Steelers' passing attack has been kind of a mess outside of a outside of that long pass to James Washington last week. It's been pretty much stuck in neutral lately and I'm not the the one hope that I think the Steelers have on offense to get things going is kind of what we saw last week in the rushing attack 
with the return of Benny Snell to the lineup. And uh, the, the Browns didn't see Benny Snell last time. They got a, a dose, a full dose of uh, <laughs> they got a full dose of Jalen Samuels and uh, Trey Edmonds and Tony Brooks James. Uh, Brooks James is not on the roster anymore. And the first two guys, the Browns, I'm sure, would take a healthy dose of that uh, seven <laughs> seven days a week uh, and twice on Tuesday if they could, because uh, those guys those guys were not are not very good. No offense to them. And uh, the Steelers' rushing attack, it wasn't just them. The Browns' defensive front overwhelmed the Steelers' offensive line in that game. But the Steelers could not establish any sort of a rushing attack, and they were able to get that going against the Bengals. Benny Snell had 96 yards. And as a team with newcomer Kareth White, they were over 135 yards on the day. Granted, against the worst rushing defense in the league, but nonetheless, it was an important game for the Steelers' rushing attack. And Benny Snell looked like a, a legitimate NFL running back, so... I think that besides yeah. besides the quarterback change, I think that's the one key difference. And looking at just the raw statistics for the Browns, the one weak spot on the defense appears to be the rushing defense. Well, statistically speaking, but up front the Browns I think are the strongest. And um, I think when you look back at who the Browns have played so far this season, rushing has been the strength of some of these teams. And that's why statistically – we see the rushing attack being the weakness. However, I think just looking at the, the raw talent of, of the defense and the makeup of it and schematically, I just worry more about the, the big pass plays that have burned, burned the Browns um, over in several of the games that they've played, certainly in the 49ers game and in the, in the Broncos game. The, the big passing attack has been the issue as well as some penalties in the secondary, although I think every team is struggling with that nowadays. But uh, you're right about the Snell Snell in the lineup now is really poses a threat, and I am concerned about that as well, and also him sneaking out of the backfield and and potentially being a receiving threat. We haven't seen a whole lot from Snell as a receiver yet, so uh, I'm okay. not. Uh, one, one thing I will say is that they, I expect to see him on passing downs just because the team does trust him and pass. He's the best pass protecting running back because James Conner. Okay. We, we didn't really go through the injury report, but James Conner, Juju Smith Schuster's out. He did clear concussion protocol. I just wanted to mention that he still has that knee injury, so he's out. James Conner is doubtful. He was even talking about surgery this week, so I doubt he's going to play. So it's going to be a lot of Benny Snell and maybe Jalen Samuels, who's the Steelers receiving back, but they didn't play him much last week. And even though Snell's not a big receiving back, he might catch a couple. They just trust him more in pass protection. And uh, I guess my two big questions about the Browns' defense is, number one, let's start up front. I mean, Miles Garrett was picked number one overall for a reason. Losing him for the season is a big blow to that defense. Obviously, Olivier Vernon, who has uh, has been dealing with a uh, knee injury, he's questionable. Maybe he will, maybe he won't play. But it seems like it's going to be up to him, Ogan Joby, Sheldon Richardson, to try to recreate some pressure in the absence of Miles Garrett. Uh, are you confident that they're going to be able to at least provide somewhat of a push? Because you can't you you can't do the same things that you were doing without Miles Garrett. But I mean, it's not like this is a talentless group either. No, and I think uh, it is going to look a lot different. They're not going to have as much pressure from the edge. They're not going to be able to collapse pockets as well. It's going to be a different look, but if Sheldon Richardson, uh, especially I'm I'm confident in Richardson, and and if Vernon can play, that would be a huge boost to this team because he's more of the same style of pass rusher as Garrett, and he can wreck a game as well. People forget that. He hasn't had the most overwhelming uh, statistics to start this season, but he can wreck a game, and I think the pressure will now come more from the interior by uh, more penetration and and getting up the middle and uh, getting into the pocket that way rather than Garrett's abilities to just collapse the pocket. So it'll look a lot different, but I'm still pretty confident in this group. Don't think it'll be the same. Um, Stopping the run, I think they will not miss Garrett as much as in the past rush obviously because Garrett was arguably the best pass rusher in football but um I I don't think this will define the Browns on defense 
Okay. And you mentioned your concern of the back end. And these concerns are probably going to be magnified when you already mentioned Morgan Burnett came off one of his best games ever against the Steelers a few weeks ago. He tore his Achilles. It, you know, it sucked to see him leave with that injury. So you've already got a, a new guy in Justin Burrison. I mean, he's he's played. It's not like he hasn't played, but he's been put into uh, a starting role. And uh, Austin, uh, you told me that Demarius Randall has been benched, correct? Yeah, Tamaris Randall was, uh, he's not, it's not injury related. He's been ruled out for this game. He did not fly with the team. And I was hoping actually John could shed more light on that because obviously we don't really follow the Browns as heavy. I saw the reports that he was not going to join the team for this game. I didn't see why. And I don't know if that was available to you, John, and maybe you could shed some light onto why that was happening or what happened. I did not actually uh, find anything about that. Uh, as far as the reason goes, um, I assume it was a violation of, of team policy of some sort, but uh, I do not believe, at least I missed it, if it was released these details of that, no. Okay, so yeah, he's going to be out for this uh, this game, and uh, so the safeties, the safeties are going to be a little bit uh, shorthanded, to say the least. Yes, and they kind of were to begin with, so that's <laughs> that just magnifies this issue, especially against the Steelers, um, who now I think have to rely more on their size in their receiving, and that's going to be a problem for the Browns' safeties if they can't jam some of these tight ends at the line of scrimmage. But um, I, again, it's, it comes down to up front. So, all right, so uh, to shed some light here, a Pro Football Talk article from – 2.30 this, uh, this afternoon, it says, uh, I quote, uh, De- Cleveland defensive back Demarius Randall won't be on the field for the rematch. Mary Kay Cabot of Cleveland.com reports that Randall has been ruled out of Sunday's game due to a coach's decision. The move to keep Randall, who isn't injured, off the field seems to reflect an effort to ensure th- things stay under control, and it's not hard to wonder that the decision was made by someone higher than higher on the Browns and or NFL organizational chart than Freddie Kitchens. So it seems like this article seems to be suggesting that someone higher than Freddie Kitchens, maybe even someone in the league attempted, was trying to keep him out of the, uh, okay, that's interesting. Remember, uh, Randall was ejected for a hit on Deontay Johnson in that game where uh, Johnson was visibly bleeding from his ear too. So, uh, I well, think it's I think it's kind of interesting that this this comes out like now. I'm not sure why. I don't know. It seems kind of vague. Well, I will say that uh, following the the game, so many of the Browns defensive players uh, following two weeks ago as a game, they really came out with uh, strongly condemning Garrett's actions. But I didn't see anything hear anything from him um and being ejected from the game certainly uh (laughs) is a bad look as well so i don't know that that doesn't terribly surprise me when you talk about somebody higher than kitchens making that decision and speaking of kitchens we were talking about it briefly uh he there was an instagram photo posted of him with uh a, a browns fan uh wearing that that uh at least in pittsburgh infamous shirt that says pittsburgh started it and now make no mistake, the, there are Steelers fans that have created a shirt that says Cleveland started it as well. So, you know, make make that what make of that what you will. But uh, Kitchens was uh, seen in this picture with uh, with the shirt on. So uh, obviously not a great look, and it's just it's unfortunate because, you know, here we are talking about something other than the game itself, and it's just it it's really been a circus when it comes to. Uh, when it comes to the this incident in the post uh, post uh, post incident, anyways, it feels like we're not talking as much about the game now, and more about this, uh, you know, other stuff. And it's just, you know, I don't know, John. I just uh, you just got to be smarter, really. Yeah, you do. That's, to me, that doesn't, you know, do much. I, I don't really. I don't want to say I don't care, but it's like, eh, yeah, it's not a huge deal. I, I think Kitchens was definitely uh, very apologetic and just so disturbed following the, the win and genuinely distraught by everything that went down. But this kind of makes it look like he, 
he isn't, and he's making light of it, so I'm kind of confused. Um, not a good look. Um, I'm I'm willing to move past it, but I can certainly see as as a Pittsburgh fan being really triggered by this because that's that was a crime that happened out there. Yeah. I didn't really care personally for the the shirt didn't really bother me. Just, just just I felt like it was overblown. Like I get it, but like it was just a gift to his dad. I actually laughed about it because I found it funny. Like the coincidence that I don't know if you guys saw the circumstance where he took that picture. He was going to see. Uh, I think it's uh, I, whatever the Mister Rogers movie is called, uh, and it's just it's funny because oh, he's a Pittsburgh a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Rogers, so it just yeah. it's just like really funny to me the, the circumstance. Yeah, I mean that that's that's just the thing though, and we we've learned about that with the we were talking about it before, John, about how a lot of stuff with Antonio Brown over the years, it's stuff that like like it doesn't need to be made a big deal of but it's always no matter what happens it's like you have to just assume that something is going to be made a big deal about because uh that's just that's just kind of the way the world works and things can be spun in any which way and like you said I don't really think that there was really any malice behind it I mean he was just taking a picture with the fan and they said that the Browns released a statement that I think I think it was something like his daughter or something got it got the shirt for him for yeah, like daughter gave it to him. yeah so not a big deal so you know but people are people wouldn't know that unless they read the whole article so they're just you know it's all about the headline grabbing but we all know that yeah and i i'm glad that we're able to to move past that i hate to see what the the broadcasters and the whole production of tomorrow's game is going to how they're going to react to all that because you need some sort of headline to grab everybody's oh. attention before the game to kind of hype it up. But you, you know, it doesn't have any impact on the play on the field. Yeah, you know that we're going to be hearing about it tomorrow. So let's just let's just remember that and just uh, let's continue to move past it. So let's get back to the game now, uh, Steelers Browns. One thing that was really interesting to me, and I was we were talking a little bit about Devlin Hodges and his ability to kind of make more plays with his feet. I really think that was the biggest difference, other than the four turnovers from the Steelers in the last meeting between these two teams, was Baker Mayfield's ability to break the pocket. The Steelers have been fantastic at getting pressure against opposing quarterbacks this year and forcing turnovers. They had only one sack in that Thursday night game against the Browns. They have 38 on the year, so only having one was a letdown for them. And then not forcing a turnover, that's only the second time this season the Steelers have not had a turnover in a game. The only other time was week one against the Patriots. So your Browns offense was able to come through. They didn't they didn't put up a ton of points, but they were able to do something against the Steelers defense that was has not been common this year. And a lot of that was big plays made from Baker Mayfield in the passing game when he was able to break the pocket. Can you talk a little bit about his transition or really his growth this year because he had a lot of struggles early in the season and now I think three or four weeks in a row now he's he's been looking a lot more like the guy that we saw finish up last season on a hot streak he's made more sound decisions as this season has gone on he seems less overwhelmed and like you said to your point about breaking the pocket that has been huge and with the receivers that uh the Browns now added the big play receivers for this season that allows uh, for some deeper routes, which throws the defense off balance a little bit and allows him to escape the pocket more. The Steelers struggled in their meeting two weeks ago, containing Mayfield in the pocket. And that led to that led him to be able to use his escape ability and make some big throws. But yeah, you have to credit Mayfield for, growing this year and, and maturing, I think, both as a player and as a person. And um, I gave him a ton of credit for his past few performances. And we know the ground game has been a critical part of the Browns' attack this season. Nick Chubb has been fantastic. He does uh, – I don't know if I'd call it a problem per se. I mean, he, he didn't really have this issue before the Patriots game, but it feels like he's been fumbling a little more lately. Is that something you're concerned about? I am not concerned about that at all. Um, his fumble, well, two of his fumbles in the Patriots game uh, were almost self-induced. I mean, he, he ran into a, a Browns player, which caused a fumble, and then another one, a, 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 our offensive lineman's foot knocked it out. So it, a couple of those fumbles did not really concern me. Um, he put one on the ground last week, but 
overall, Chubb has been able to protect the ball, and um, I think that the the reward that we get from him on the ground is a lot greater than the risk of him him putting the ball on the ground, and that has shown so far this season. Yeah, his his track record speaks for itself. I was just curious because when the Steelers had Le'Veon Bell, I mean, I'm sure you remember he was known for not fumbling often. There was a stretch in the 2016 season where I think he fumbled like four times in the span of like five games or something, and everyone was like, oh, no, what's going on? But when you touch the ball that much, you know, law of averages say eventually you're going to fumble a few times. It happens. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So I just wanted to make sure that from your perspective, because obviously you've seen him more more than we have, uh, if you thought that there was something going on with him or if it was just one of those things. So uh, Kareem Hunt. Uh, what has he added to the offense the last few weeks? Well, he's he's added a, a jolt um, behind Chubb that we really needed that Hilliard wasn't giving this offense. And Kareem Hunt, is, he's also been a, a great pass uh, protector as well, which I didn't really realize the Browns were getting that when they signed him. But they've put him in on third downs and passing situations, and he's been able to actually uh, pick up blitzes and, and help out with that. He's been able to catch balls out of the backfield, um, especially last week in the Dolphins game. He had a couple of big plays out of the backfield and short yardage situations. I'm confident that with two backs in the game, the Browns can go to either on a third or fir- fourth and short and get the necessary yardage. And Kareem Hunt brings that versatility and that depth to their running back position that they were missing for the first eight weeks of the season. Now, the Browns do deploy – you guys do deploy both of them at the same time, right? I seem to remember that you did a couple weeks ago. Yeah, um, I actually like that formation, that more sort of power running two-back formation. Um, But Kitchens – and this Browns offense, they seem hesitant to use it, and I, I'm disappointed in that. I think typically because over the past you know, 10, 15 years, we've seen the two halfback system go away, and now it's usually a lot of three receiver sets, or if you do have a lead blocker, it's a fullback and not two running backs because typically the two halfbacks, they're, they're usually not accustomed to blocking. So if you have both of them back there, you're usually going to ask one to block, and I think that right. usually teams aren't comfortable with that. But – uh, we've seen teams start to use a little more of that. I think it's called a pony package, but uh, maybe the, uh, the Browns seem to have used it. They're not using it a ton, but they are using it at least a little bit. And when you've got two of the better running backs in the league, why not, right? Right, and I think they, they're they really sensitive to the, the, using the three receivers in, in a formation. And, I mean, that makes sense. And they also like to have a tight end on the field most downs. Um, but, no, I like that two-back set, especially in the shorter yardage situations. And uh, this one can even pass per side, too, and Kareem Hunt's played great in that role. So, yeah, I like that formation. One area of concern right now, though, is the fact that uh, starting blindside protector Greg Robinson has been ruled out of this game with a concussion which means he's going to be going up against Bud Dupree, who came up with a key strip sack uh, in both the Bengals games this year for the Steelers, and uh, he's been having a breakout effort so far. And uh, Chris Hubbard going to be going against T.J. Watt, who's been having a, a right around uh, what you might consider a defensive player of the year caliber season. Uh, they were able to handle the Steelers' defensive front two weeks ago, but uh, are you concerned that without Greg Robinson, things could be – a you could have a little more rough of a time this week. Absolutely, and I think I I would be somewhat concerned with Greg Robinson too. You know, just because they were able to handle those edge rushers two weeks ago, um, I'm not confident that they would that those uh, rushers would have these same struggles this week because of just how talented they are, and and the tackles have been the strength of the Browns' offensive line so far this season. Um, but, but again, <laughs> Bud Dupree and, and Watt are two of the best rushers that the Browns have faced this year. So I'm definitely concerned about um, making sure that they have a clean pocket for Mayfield and, and the depth on the offensive line is not great. So, yeah, that's a major concern coming into this game. That's a matchup to watch. All right, and uh, 
I don't think I have any more thoughts or questions about. I got one more thing. Go right ahead. I just wanted, I just wanted to ask, how do you feel about Justin McCray? He's the one that's stepping in uh, for Greg Robinson, right? Yeah, and I haven't really seen anything from him, um, which is more of a concern. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. We're definitely going to need to pull some some uh, stunts and double teams and things of that nature, especially I, protecting Mayfield's blind side. I've got uh, his. That, uh, I'm I've, sorry, you go ahead. I was just saying, I got his. Uh, I just went on Browns doc, uh, clevelandbrowns.com and pulled up his uh, bio here. He was an undrafted free agent from uh, the Tennessee Titans. He also played with the Green Bay Packers and spent two years in the Arena Football League. Pretty interesting. Uh, he's listed as a guard on the uh, website, so it seems like he is what Chris Hubbard was for the Steelers before he signed his contract with the Browns. I don't know if you remember, John, but Chris Hubbard with the Steelers was a backup that played – all five uh, offensive line positions, and eventually yeah. an injury to Marcus Gilbert two years in a row gave Chris Hubbard about, I think, 16 starts at right tackle over two years, and he played well enough to obviously parlay that into a nice contract with the Browns. And ha- has he been playing well? Uh, I mean, he played well he has, two weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, he's been one of the stronger parts of the um, offensive line, but I don't know. <laughs> That's that's interesting to hear. I actually did not know that he was a guard, but I think I think you see that a lot more now. Those backups, especially who can play all five positions, that doesn't mean that they excel at all five positions, though. <laughs> but we'll see what happens this week. Indeed, and the the Steelers have, I, I think, position flexibility is really the key uh, in today's modern NFL. But the Steelers have that right now with their new starting center, BJ Finney, who can play both guard positions and will be playing center. So that's also something to look for. When you've got a guy like Sheldon Richardson matched up against you, so uh, be sure to look out for that. Uh, any thoughts on special teams? Uh, the Steelers' return man Ryan Switzer is on injured reserve, so he is done for the year. And uh, it's been a whole lot of Deontay Johnson, who uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard us talk about him, John, but he makes us nervous. He, he can break the big one, it looks like, but he also it looks like he could fumble the ball and muff it too. So... Uh, there could be a big play for the Steelers punt return unit in both good and bad ways. So just be on the lookout for that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, um, where did he come from? Toledo, correct? He was a okay, right? Am I right? At Toledo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Steelers get Seems a ton like- of players from Toledo for whatever reason, but yeah, to- he was a third round pick out of Toledo this year. Huh. Um, and then uh, elsewhere, I think the Steelers wasn't Kareth White the kick returner. Austin saw it for like one one time, and he ran it back for sixteen yards, and then it never happened again. Yeah. Uh, so the same thing as we were saying two weeks ago, John. The Steelers kick return unit is approaching historically bad levels. So uh, yeah, you know, we'll we'll thank you if you kick it into the end zone. Yes, and I noticed that a couple of weeks ago too. Is is uh, the Brown special teams did adjust for that, and it actually worked out, which is unbelievable. And those penalties on special teams, they hurt everybody. But boy, the Steelers have a, a special talent of uh, making sure that any return is is brought back. It's uh, the Danny Smith special, I suppose. That's our <laughs> special teams coordinator. He has an uncanny ability to scheme up like punt blocks but also has an uncanny ability to not coach guys on how to block on kick returns. It's it's really special. I've never seen it before. But uh, anyways, enough about that. Um, all right, let's get into big picture stuff, uh, John. So uh, when talking about the Browns offense, we, they had a pretty solid performance against a good Steelers defense a couple weeks ago. Now you're minus your top le- uh, left tackle here. Uh, how are you feeling about the – just give me a brief general overview of how you think the Browns offense is going to fare against the Steelers defense. And then once you're done with that, we'll go to the other side and talk about the Browns defense and the Steelers offense. Well, the it's a conditional statement. If the Browns are able to stay dedicated to the run, then they will be just fine. But that's been a big if for this offense and, and – Freddie Kitchens play calling, who gets very, very pass happy. I, I know you got the, the two big threats on the outside uh, receiving threats, but they have to 
stay disciplined and stick to this run, especially because some of these deep passes uh, you require a lot of time in the pocket, and Mayfield's not going to get as much this week. I look for Bud Dupree uh, and T.J. Watt to have big games this week, and I think the Browns will be okay scoring in the maybe the low twenties ish, which we'll see if that's good enough. And I know we'll talk about that later, but um, they have to stay disciplined and dedicated to the run, especially with Chubb mixing Hunt in there. And then uh, what about on the uh, other side there with the Browns defense, obviously they're without their best defensive player in miles Garrett. Uh, but again, uh, the Steelers offense has seen its struggles and now they've got a new quarterback in there. So uh, what are you feeling about that side of the ball? Well, that's interesting because I think that, uh, again, like you guys are saying, you just don't know what you're going to get from Hodges. So that's the more interesting thing to look out for is is how is Hodges going to play and, and how much will the Steelers uh, give Hodges the key to the car, so to speak? I mean, are they going to let him air it out and hopefully convert on some of those big passing plays like the one he did last week in Cincinnati? Or are they just going to let him do what he can, take, take, take what the defense gives him? Um, I'm fairly confident that the Browns' defense is going to be able to generate some sort of pressure on him, but that doesn't mean that he isn't going to uh, dink and dunk his way down the field and, and uh, the Steelers aren't going to be able to put up at least more than seven points on the board. Alrighty then. Uh, let's move into our X Factors and Bold Predictions part of the show. Uh, Austin, uh, you didn't have the trivia question, did you? I did not. I forgot. I just no, no, figured no. one earlier on in the week, but uh, I was going to say don't don't worry to. don't worry about it this time because we obviously have uh, we have three people this time. I just wanted to go over real quickly the a brief history of Steelers and Browns. This is uh, the oldest rivalry in the AFC. Uh, the teams have met. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to do some math here, guys, one moment here. I should have done this before. But they've met a total of, uh, whoops, that's not right. Oh, my goodness. I am on the struggle bus here, guys. I'm sorry. Death is hard. We forgive you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So it was. Uh, this will be the 136th matchup between the two teams. Obviously, they met just two weeks ago. The Browns won 21-7 to on Thursday night. Uh, improving the Browns' overall record against the Steelers. They're still a losing record against the Steelers, but uh, right now it is 75-59-1 in favor of the Steelers. Uh, and uh, just a fun fact, the Browns have a chance to do something against the Steelers that they've seldom done in recent years, and that is two things. Beat the Steelers twice in a row, that's one. And then furthermore, they could sweep them in a season. So the last time the Browns were able to accomplish these respective feats were... Uh, First, uh, beat the Steelers twice in a row was in September of 2000 when the new Browns improved their all-time record against the Steelers to 2-1. So this was the first three matchups between the new Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers won that opening game 43-0 in Cleveland. The Browns won the the next two games, though. They improved their record to 2-1, and and obviously things have not really gone their way since then, but... There was a time then when the Browns had won two straight against the Steelers. So that's the last time the Browns had won two straight. And the last time they swept the Steelers in a season, you have to go all the way back to 1988, which was uh, really the height of the Browns' offensive powers and really overall powers in the post-Jim Brown era. I think it was three straight AFC Championship game appearances, and uh, the Browns were were a powerhouse at that time, and they swept the Steelers. I think they won six or seven straight against the Steelers in the – 86 through 89 seasons and uh the Steelers meanwhile were falling apart at that point uh all of the remnants of the 70s teams were gone and they were in a sort of a mini rebuild in fact the 1988 season is the worst season the Steelers have had since 1970 and the Steelers finished 5 and 11 that year so to give you an idea of how long it's been John this could be a huge huge victory for the Browns not to mention the fact that uh, you know the Browns are five and six, and the Steelers are six and five. This is uh, the Steelers being in the sixth seed in the wild card on the AFC side. This is a huge, huge game. Yeah, there are huge playoff implications on the line, and, and uh, doing something that hasn't been done since Tim Couch was quarterback is uh, something as well that's significant to note. Twenty-four quarterbacks later, here we are uh, with a chance to sweep the season series. 
and will and win two in a row against the Steelers, which you wouldn't think would be that uh, rare of a feat, but but it would be. And uh, yeah, you're right. This this playoff picture, and I do I'd like your guys' thoughts, you know, briefly on this. You have four teams now fighting for one spot. There's now really only one spot open uh, now that the Buffalo Bills have improved to nine and three. So you got like the Raiders, Titans, Browns, and Steelers all fighting for this one spot. And this game, almost, I don't know if you guys would agree with me on this, it's almost like a de facto mini playoff game within the playoff race. I thought that this personally was the biggest game for both the Steelers and the Browns. It has so many implications. And like you said, it's kind of like a mini playoff game. For you guys, it's uh, it's got the implication that John went over earlier, where it's like it's going to be your first time sweeping the Steelers and winning two in a row in quite a while. It also has the implications that if you don't win this, it almost effectively ends your season. But also on the flip side, if you guys win this, like it, it gives you a pretty good chance you'd have the tiebreaker over the Steelers easily because of the head-to-head matchup. And then it gives you a chance to get in there with a, a somewhat easier schedule because you guys have the Bengals twice still, right? Well, yeah, yeah your, your divisional twice. divisional yeah. record is going to be yeah. outstanding. Yeah, because well, you guys beat the Ravens once know. as well. Yeah, so you got the Ravens again, but that's a home game. Um, but if we're able to beat the Bengals twice and win tomorrow's game, then we're at least 5-1 and one in the division. That's crazy. My goodness. Yeah, that's really good for you guys. Really, really good. That helps so the conference record, too. Game. So, I mean, that should give you tiebreakers, I would think. Yeah, um, if, yeah. If we could get to the tie, <laughs> that's the that's the hard part. Especially now, if you look at how well Tennessee has been playing in the recent weeks too. I think quietly they're and you, uh, you, one of the front runners. And there was a, another team that you I don't I don't remember if you mentioned, but Indianapolis is right there too. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and there, teams were eliminated though after this week because Colts and Titans have played each say, other yeah. effectively ruins one they're they're also playing yeah so cleveland browns pittsburgh steelers tennessee titans indianapolis colts there's a lot going on in the afc playoff picture tomorrow Austin, uh, i want to say really quick go ahead it just broke uh, olivier vernon is expected to be active for tomorrow's game uh, barring something uh, unexpected occurring according to Josina anderson on twitter okay then so uh, that's uh, obviously now the Browns' best uh, pass rusher uh, going to be getting a chance to go against the Steelers. So that's good news for the Browns and not good news for the Steelers. So, okay, uh, let's uh, transition back into the X factors and bold predictions. So uh, usually the way we do it is uh, Austin and I have uh, kind of almost like a draft where uh, one of us will ask the other a trivia question, and if uh, – you know, if I'm asking Austin, he gets it right. He gets to choose whether or not he wants to pick the X Factor first, like one guy that he really wants, or uh, he can go second and he gets to pick two guys, uh, one on offense, one on defense. So uh, just letting you know how that usually works just okay. because we, we like to have fun with that. But I guess we're yeah. not going to be doing that this time. So um, I guess why don't we just go kind of on a rotational basis and I'll go last. Uh, John, I mean, you're going to be picking Browns players, so uh, uh, have you got someone in mind or do you want us to go first? Uh, so uh, am I starting on a particular side of the, the ball? Just Whatever side you want, give us uh, the player okay. uh, that you're picking as your X factor, why, you know, how you think they're going to contribute, and then uh, give us your bold prediction on that side of the ball. Well, I think uh, – on offense, Kareem Hunt is the X factor in this game, coming off of a of two strong weeks in a row, and um, especially his receiving out of the backfield is going to be huge. The Browns they're going to have to rely on the running game. Absolutely have to rely on the running game uh, this week, especially with the injuries up up front, and um, that's going to be a problem for the Browns. So they need to rely on the their rushing attack, and Kareem Hunt is that second back that's going to provide the depth and hopefully the versatility to be able to run the ball um, and catch some balls out of the backfield um, on little design screens and on little check downs. So uh, Kareem Hunt is the X factor. And if the Browns are able to get, I put the number as a hundred uh, receiving yards from both Hunt and Chubb, I think they're in good shape offensively in this game. All right. You go ahead next Austin. I'm going to actually go to defense for mine. I'm going to pick Bud Dupree, kind of cheap 
But I, I really wanted to – I think that he's going to be the biggest game wrecker of any since he's going against Justin McCray. Uh, I think that uh, he he's had that strip sack last week. He had the strip sack against uh, the Bengals earlier on in the year. I think that he could be the, the one that uh, wrecks the game. He's been really uh, good this year. And I think that uh, last game the, against the Browns, the Steelers struggled against containing uh, – Baker Mayfield. It was really rough. That's why they ended up with only one sack. I think that he could be the difference in picker and uh, here and for Bud Dupree. I think that he gets two sacks and another uh, forced fumble in this game. Uh, so that was me. Who's yours? All right, I'm gonna go to the offensive side of the ball, and uh, I'm gonna be talking about Benny Snell. Now the Steelers, as a team, ran for. Let me see the number here. Just 58 yards against the Browns two weeks ago. They got almost nothing going. I mean, I think they had a, like a – their longest run of the day came from Mason Rudolph to give you an idea of how, how well the offensive rushing attack was. So the Steelers are going to have to establish the line of scrimmage if they want to be able to get the ground game going. And make no mistake, they need to get the ground game going in order to beat this team. Uh, you're going to need, obviously, turnovers and whatnot with the way the Steelers' offense is played. But if you want them to move the ball – it's going to have to start with Benny Snell on the ground. And he had a great breakout performance against the Bengals last week, but obviously the, the Bengals' defense is a pretty pretty talent, pretty talent devoid of talent. The Browns' defense, while it hasn't been statistically uh, dominant, is still a much, much better unit. So I'll be interested to see how he plays. And for kind of a bold prediction, I'll, I'll set like that kind of important number at – I'll set it at 90 yards – and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another one. I'll say five first downs. So he needs to convert five first downs and uh, 90 rushing yards. So that's my uh, offensive uh, bold prediction, kind of numbers to reach, if you will. Uh, so, John, give me your second man, your defensive X Factor. X Factor on defense, Greedy Williams. Um, I'm really interested to see how this week goes. It, it was a rough start for the early draft pick, but... Lately, I've been impressed. Um, he's cut down on penalties, and he's been able to play a lot better in uh, in coverage. But that's uh, one area where the Browns overall are going to struggle tomorrow is is uh, the back end. And I think that even though Hodges is an in- inexperienced quarterback and you don't know what you're going to get from him, tackling in the secondary is going to be huge. I think the Steelers are going to rely a lot on Vance McDonald and some of the size that they do have. Um, and I, I think Snell out of the backfield is going to be a factor as well. So tackling in the secondary is going to be huge. And I'm just looking forward to seeing Grady Williams because he's played better in recent weeks. And I think he could take it to a new level this week. Um, as far as the defense as a whole, though, uh, I think that they need to hold the Steelers to less than 30 percent on third down conversions that's going to be huge because third down is is the biggest down and with an inexperienced quarterback they have a a chance to manufacture a pass rush on third down and i hope they're able to do that and i think they finally will be able to hold the steelers on third down which has been a struggle in recent years especially on the okay so you're you're saying that the the bull predictions hold the Steelers to less than 30 percent on the third down conversion right yes right Oh, cool. That's an interesting one. I don't think anyone. I don't think either of us have ever done a bold prediction on a on a uh, third down conversion rate. That's kind of cool. You you have your own mark on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, what do you think, Austin? Uh, for me, my last X factor is going to be BJ Finney. Uh, you said it earlier that uh, the Browns are probably going to send pressure differently and mostly up the middle. Uh, so with him being the one guy that's like not supposed to be there, I figured I'd make him the X factor depending on how he plays. It's going to be how the Steelers do. The offensive line did not play well la- uh, last time. So for my bold prediction, I'm going to say they only get, as a whole, the offensive line only gives up one sack and no more than three quarterback hits. Because uh, they really had to change up how they uh, played last week, and that just leaves uh, leaves you, John. What's your last defensive X factor and bold prediction? Right before I get to that, uh, John, did you? Uh, it was going into last week, but did you know that the Steelers' third down percentage uh, when they were third and short, so that's third and three or less, was only one percent better than their percentage when it was third and I think seven or longer. So I noticed that um, coming into the, the Thursday night game, and that was 
unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen a team struggle so much on third down and short. Um, so it does seem kind of funny. But um, at the same time, in past years, the Steelers on third down has, have absolutely shredded the Browns, especially at home. I want to say the past four or five years, they've been up at, the, at just a superhuman number in like the high 60s or 70s uh, percentage-wise converting on third down, and that has to stop for this Browns team. But yeah, the short yardage situations, they've really struggled. Indeed. And, uh, you know, I guess that third and five, uh, third and five, third and six apparently is the Steelers' sweet spot for whatever reason. I guess that's where we got you where we want you. But not third and one. Good, 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 my goodness, no. But uh, any case... Uh, on the defensive side, I'm going to go with Steven Nelson, the Steelers cornerback. When he was signed, and Austin, I know you'll concur with me, when he signed with the Pittsburgh Steelers, it was a massive contract. He, you know, Coming over from Kansas City, he was the most targeted cornerback in all of football last year. He gave up a lot of big plays, but he also had four interceptions. The Steelers picked him up in the hopes that he would be a, you know, a big play guy. And believe it or not, He's been less of a big play guy and more of the steady lockdown corner that you know you you would expect to see from what you know Darrell Rivas used to be. And now I'm not saying he was as good as Darrell Rivas was, but he's been having a very good year, and teams haven't been attacking him because of how sound he's been. His worst game, believe it or not, was against I'd say the Browns. Uh, he gave up I think it was 60 yards to Odell Beckham Jr. on four catches. But 42 of those yards came in the, on that early big play when I think Nelson was expecting some safety help. Uh, the rest of the game, it was just three catches for 18 yards for Beckham Jr. And it's going to take another good performance from Steven Nelson to keep the Browns' offense down in this one because obviously you're going to need some turnovers in this one, but Nelson's going to have to continue to play great. And he played pretty well a couple weeks ago, but... Obviously, the Steelers' defense, even though they played probably well enough to win two weeks ago, they didn't win. Uh, it's taking more than playing good defense. You have to play great defense the way the Steelers' offense has played lately. You have to play great defense in order to win. And uh, that's why I think it's going to take a great performance from Steven Nelson that's going to include you know, continuing to be a shutdown guy. But when you've got Odell Beckham Jr. on that side, he's going to get targeted. So it's going to be up to Steven Nelson to come up with the plays on the back end. And whether or not he does, I think, is going to be an important part of who wins this game. So uh, I'm going officially with cornerback Steven Nelson for the Pittsburgh Steelers on defense. And uh, for that important number, I'll go with uh, I'll go with keeping Odell Beckham Jr. under. I'll keep it at, uh, you know, I guess 60 was where he was at last time, so I'll say keep it under 60 yards and no receiving touchdowns for Beckham Jr. Now, again, he did not have a touchdown last week or two weeks ago, but that first big play was really key. So I guess keeping Beckham Jr. under 60 yards and no explosive plays against. So that's that's my key uh, bold prediction, if you will, for Steven Nelson on that side of the ball. So uh, now that we've gotten a look at all sides uh, – going into this game talk to me about how you're feeling uh who wants to go first uh give me a final score prediction oh uh, we'll let the guests go first you go first john oh great okay no pressure right <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll put all the pressure on you we'll, we'll only hold it against you if you're wrong well you know I, that's uh that's rough because i, I honestly feel like this game could go either way this is a uh, the coin flip in my mind. I think we're going to see a lot of field goals in this game. I don't know. I just have a feeling. These teams uh, <laughs> have both – obviously, I, I know you guys know about struggling to, to get into the end zone, but the Browns have had their, their share of struggles on the road uh, getting into the end zone. Well, that said, I do just think that Cleveland's got – too much talent, and I would rather bet on on the talent on the offensive side that Cleveland has as opposed to what the Steelers have right now and how how beat up they are. Obviously, it's it's going to be close and it's not going to be easy, but uh, I'll say Browns twenty four nineteen. And again, that's a lot of field goals. All right, I'll follow you. Uh, I'm going to pick the Browns to win. Also, I'm going to have them win twenty one fifteen. I think that the Browns are playing for. A little bit more here they're going to be hungry this is like this is it this is basically this is the game like you lose here and it's it's not exactly over but it's 
it's tough sledding from there. You're uh, a few games back from Pittsburgh, who would now have that likely six seed pretty pretty uh, locked up for the most part. Uh, even though, and then even then, you're behind the Raiders. You're behind uh, whoever uh, wins the Titans Colts matchup is next. It's going to be tough sledding. So I think the Browns are to play hungry and they're going to come on top, uh, 21-15. And I agreed with the field goals, which is why I think. Steelers only uh, get one touchdown. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even say that right. Uh, but why it's going to be such a weird, weird score. <laughs> I, I couldn't even do the math in my head. Uh, is that a five so, field goal often? Is that what you were thinking? We've seen Chris Boswell do that I, before. Th- <laughs> do it, yeah. And I uh, this this game, I uh, I don't feel as I don't feel like the Steelers are going to be helped by a bad Austin uh, Cybert game. So I, I don't think the Browns are going to struggle in that regard. So I think Browns win 21-15, and that just leaves you, John. Now, weren't there three missed kicks in that last game? Oh, I thought it was yeah. two. There were at well, least two. Boswell there were, Boswell missed two, right? Boswell missed just one because he's only missed two oh. in the year. Oh, uh, okay. But I, I remember oh. Cybert missed okay. at least one. For some reason, I thought he missed two, but now that doesn't make Cyber sense. Cybert missed two. That's that's what I, I was thinking. So it is three total because I, I almost forgot Boswell missed a kick. It's because uh, Barry screwed up the hole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, so it was three. You were right. But, yeah, I think we all have kind of a similar feeling on this game. Look, uh, the Browns have been playing better football of late than the Steelers have. They've been playing like a cohesive team. And uh, I'm not interested in, like, all oh, who have they played, whatnot. They're playing better. They're playing like a more cohesive team. And we've seen the results on the field lately. And, uh, you know, yes, they're missing their best player in Miles Garrett on the defensive side. And they've got a lot of shuffling going on in the back end. But they're getting the big plays when they need them. And, uh, you know, I just, can't tr- I just can't trust the Steelers' offense right now. I really don't know what to expect from them. I feel a little bit better seeing as how they were able to establish the run last week, but I'm just not convinced right now. I need to see more than one good game of being able to run the ball uh, for me to think that the Steelers' offense is going to be able to do anything significant. And on the other side of the ball, uh, Baker Mayfield's been coming into his own again lately here, and the Browns' offense is clicking a little bit. They've got a tough matchup against a good Steelers' defense, who I think is going to be coming out to play, uh, trying to trying to uh i'm trying to think of the right word but they're going to try to kind of make up for the performance that they had a couple weeks ago where they weren't bad but they again they only got one sack and they didn't force any turnovers they're going to be extra determined to try to force more turnovers in this game and uh that being the case i still think the browns can put up at least two touchdowns maybe three so i'm going to go with the browns in a I like my weird score, so I'll take the Browns to win 18 to 10. I, I don't know where that 18 is coming from. Maybe it's going to be another safety because uh, the Steelers have been giving up a lot of those this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm feeling field goals. I mean, that really doesn't make sense, though, g- given the fact that it's going to be a bad weather game, huh? Well, I don't know. You know, you never know. I just, uh, I'm interested in. How that might come. But I just, I'm sorry to cut you. you no, you're about the safety. Uh, no, no, I, I had said everything I wanted to say. I just wanted to point out to you guys that I was the only one who picked the Browns to win two weeks ago. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, you're right, but I'm I'm the only one who was rooting for the Browns to win two weeks ago. That's also that is, fair. That's true. That's true. Alrighty, John. Uh, I think we're all set here. I just wanted to take this time to thank you so much for coming on the show i i like having you on the show i just wish it wasn't so close together because now uh, i'm not sure when we'll have the chance to bring you back on maybe we can just have you on sometime in the off season to talk about uh some of the college guys that are coming through in the nfl draft oh you know that's more my forte there you go <laughs> no what we'll, whatever guys you it's a uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you both and uh good luck to the steelers even though obviously you know, not too much luck, right? The rest of the year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but great talking with you guys, and enjoy the game tomorrow. Same to you, John. Always a pleasure. Okay. Take care, John. Thank you. You too, guys. Alrighty, that was John Gehring of eighty nine point one The Point joining us uh, to talk Steelers and Browns. Always appreciate his contribution to the show. Uh, it's been nice having him on the last couple of years, and. Uh, uh, some interesting talking points, but generally, Austin, I think the three of us are thinking pretty much on similar wavelengths here. 
I think I think we have a good uh, we all have like a similar understanding of the game or what we think is going to happen in this game. Indeed, and with that being the case, uh, let's move into what's going on around the league. And obviously, Thanksgiving. I, we didn't even mention Thanksgiving. How was your Thanksgiving, Austin? Um, my Thanksgiving was good. I didn't really watch much football. I watched that Bills Cowboys game and just kind of smiled because watching the the Cowboys. I mean, it was bittersweet because you. I wanted the, the Bills to lose as a Steelers fan, but just watching Cowboys lose is is just satisfying. So, but yeah, it was good. How was yours? It was good. It was definitely good. I watched a decent amount of football. Uh, I didn't see a ton of the late game, and I only saw the second half of the first game. But I did watch a lot of that Bills and Cowboys game, and that's the one that stuck out the most. Man, I'm sorry. I have to apologize I, You know, to all Bills fans out there. I doubted the Bills. I was kind of on the Bills most of the early part of the season, and then I jumped off the bandwagon for, like, the last three weeks. And I need to apologize. I was wrong for that because uh, – Sean McDermott's one of my favorite coaches in the NFL, and it was wrong for me to doubt him and everything that's been going on. It's just I'm so used to the Bills folding at this point in the year. But here they are now at 9-3. and three. Uh, They've got the five seed locked up. And, you know, would you believe it or not, if the Patriots slip up just once here, the Bills all of a sudden are right back in the AFC East play, uh, division race, which seems incredible. But this is the best start the Bills have had since 1996, which was before you were born and was, you know, the year I was born, to give you an idea of how long ago that was. Man, that's crazy. And the Bills get to verse the Patriots one last time, and the last time they met up, it was a really, really close game. Josh Allen got hurt, and you never know what happens if Josh Allen doesn't get hurt in that game. It might be a different game. They, they were kind of forced to not take points because they, uh, they had uh, their backup in. And uh, they ended up going for it on fourth down, uh, in the, deep in the Patriots' red zone. And instead of taking the points, they ended up losing because they they figured they probably wouldn't get there ever again. So it's going to be interesting to see if the Bills play the Patriots strong a second time. That game featured a blocked punt touchdown for the Patriots, which was a 16 to 10 final, by the way. So you got a touchdown there for the Patriots on a blocked punt, and you've got four Bills interceptions: three from Josh Allen, one from Matt Barkley. Uh, just to recap that game a little bit. So my goodness, uh, I'm not, I, you know, the Patriots at home are so much tougher to beat, but I mean, it's not like the bills have never played there before. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens this time. This time feels a little bit different. I mean, the bills, I feel like are the most disrespected nine and three team ever, because even at this win, it finally got rid of their, Oh, they haven't beat a winning team yet, but now it's, oh, they beat the only other winning team that has not beaten another winning team. So it's like you can't win. getting disrespected. Can't win. It's like no matter what they do. But I am done disrespecting them. Even if they lose the rest of their games, they still have a winning record. It's tied for the best record that they've had since 1999. Man, that's incredible. Good stuff. That early game, uh, quarterback David Blow uh, got the start for the Detroit Lions, a rookie undrafted free agent out of Purdue. And uh, the Lions have since placed uh, quarterback Jeff Driscoll on injured reserve and have signed quarterback Kyle Slaughter off of Arizona's practice squad. So the Lions continue to rotate quarterbacks and continue to lose. Uh, The Bears uh, barely staying alive in the playoff race. I'm not even sure I consider them part of it, but they are there. And uh, Jeff Driscoll goes on IR, so the quarterback rotation continues for the Lions. Yeah, I, I can't say I didn't see it happen. I mean, he, he maybe even uh, Blau out, out, outperformed what I was expecting, to be honest. Like, I, I wasn't expecting much from him. But, I mean, uh, they, they weren't able to put up points, uh, like, later in the game. So, uh, Bears ended up winning even with Trubisky. So, can't say I didn't see it coming. And then in the late game, not a whole lot going on. The Saints were just the better team. Michael Thomas dropped a pass for the first time in, like, 200 catches. It's honestly Michael Thomas for MVP. I, I, anything other than a quarterback. I know it's Lamar Jackson right now, but and he kind of deserves it, high key. But like, I still want to see someone other than a quarterback win MVP. But that's beside the point. The Saints did almost everything to try and ruin that spread. Did you? You just said you didn't see that game. Did you see what happened in that game? I watched parts of the game. I watched like parts of the end of the first half and started the second half. You know that the Falcons recovered two onside kicks in a row? Oh my goodness, no, I didn't know that. 
they the Saints were trying. This game wasn't close, and the Saints were trying everything in their power on special teams to be like, yeah, let's have the Falcons come back in the last two minutes of the game. My goodness, that's wild. <laughs> Teams haven't converted a single onside kick this year. Like to do two back to back, it's pretty incredible stuff, honestly. I'm sorry, the onside kick sucks. Get rid of it, please. Does suck. Please. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, let's get into uh, week 13 games here. So we're now after post Thanksgiving, which is now where all the critical games are going. Just like the Jets and Bengals, except wait a minute. The Jets, all of a sudden, weren't they 1-7? and seven? Yes, they were. They're now 4-7, and seven, and they get a shot at the winless Bengals who have reinserted Andy Dalton into the starting lineup hoping to get a win. The Bengals are only 3.5-point underdogs at home. How do you feel about this one? Picking Sid plus 3.5. I don't know if they're going to win, but starting Andy Dalton's a good start. And I, I was looking at the tweets earlier. I was trying to figure out who was going to be out for this game and figure out if A.J. Green was going to finally be back and uh, get his uh, start. But um, I think about it, but I'm hoping for it. I, I, I think that since he keeps us within three and a half, and I think they could win with Andy Dalton at quarterback. So, uh, what do you got? They definitely could, but the Jets are on a hot streak right now. And I gambled with the Falcons last week and lost, but I need to make up ground on you, so I'm going to take the Jets to win this uh, close one, I think. But I think they'll win it by a touchdown. So give me the Jets plus a three and a half. Um, or sorry, not plus a three and a half. To cover the three and a half points, and then uh, we'll move on. Okay, uh, we already covered the Steelers game. One o'clock, we got the Packers at the Giants. Eight and three, Packers got uh, absolutely destroyed by the 49ers last week. And the Giants have lost, uh, what is it, like five straight, something like that. The Giants are reeling, and they're six-and-a-half-point underdogs at home. Give me the Packers to cover. Uh, they've had a few disappointing weeks here. They're not a complete team, but they are a far more talented team than the New York Giants. I'm going to pick the Packers to cover as well. The Giants don't even have trivial peppers for this game, so uh, I'm going to take the Packers pretty easy, actually. Uh, yeah. Crucial matchup in the AFC South. If uh, you know the Steelers Browns is the biggest game in the AFC North, then this is the equivalent in the AFC South. Two teams fighting for their playoff lives at six and five, and still not out of the division race yet. The Colts are two and a half point favorites at home. This is tough for me because, uh, uh, wow, his name is slipping me. Marlon Mack is out, but I can't remember. Oh, T. Y. Hilton. Jeez, that was so hard for me. Uh, T.Y. Hilton and Marlon Mack are out for this game, and it really, really made me want to pick the Titans. But I can't pick against my man, Jacoby. I'm going to pick the Colts to cover here. Uh, I I feel like the Titans are a Pandora's box every single week. Like, you never know what you're going to get. You're going to get Derrick Henry with two touchdowns, 180 yards, and Ryan Tannehill, like, saving this team? Or are you going to get, like, some like them putting up, like, six points? Like, I, I don't know. It's always something new. I'm going to pick the Colts to cover. What do you got? This is as much of a coin flip as I think you could see this week. And for that reason, I'm just going to flip it and go with the Titans plus the two and a half. Yeah. Eagles at Dolphins. Uh, the Dolphins are hosting, but they're nine and a half point underdogs at home. This is, I don't know. The Eagles offense has been really bad. But 10 points is a lot, and uh, even with the Eagles' struggles, I, I have a hard time thinking they won't blow the Dolphins out, uh, who, after playing competitive football for about a month and a half, seem to be fading back into that early season. We realize we aren't as good as anyone else. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, take the Eagles uh, to cover. I'm going to agree with you. It's just Miami's just not, not a good team, and they're just – like I said last time when we talked about Miami, like new guys just start popping up on their team that I I don't even know if they're real people. Like it could be like that Sheehy Giuseppe Giuseppe that was on uh, the Browns and just like yeah I belong here, but like he was really just a homeless guy that was trying to get a tryout. That that feels like what Miami is right now. Yeah, it has not been good lately. Another team that's been struggling lately is the Jacksonville Jaguars. They host the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at one o'clock. Uh, a match of two Florida teams. The Jaguars are getting a point and a half. I don't know, man. I don't trust that team right now. Uh, Nick Foles hasn't been awful, but he also hasn't really done anything to propel that offense. They look kind of lifeless right now. And in the AFC South, where everyone's alive, they've backed themselves out of the division race. 
Uh, the Buccaneers, give me them plus the one and a half. Uh, they're still on the fringe, and they're not really going to make it. But, I mean, hey, they played competitive football most of this year. So give me them plus the one and a half. I'm going to agree with you. I think that I'd rather take the Buccaneers plus one and a half. I feel like they played good football at times. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick them based on that. Redskins at Panthers. The Redskins got their second win of the season against the Detroit Lions. The Panthers are 5-6 and six and are backsliding after a, uh, a hot run there with Kyle Allen. Uh, another 1 o'clock game. I, I don't know if the Redskins are going to win another game. I feel like that win last week was just a huge load off the shoulders for Dwayne Haskins, and now uh, they're just going to settle back in and lose the rest of them. I feel like there's a chance, though. Their division is pretty bad like i think you could make a case on beat anyone in their division even the cowboys man isn't that I sad that's pretty rough it's just like i would have never expected to say that the redskins are terrible but like the way the the way the eagles play we saw them week one the redskins nearly there were uh, if you remember this the redskins yep. were up on the uh, eagles 17 to 0 week one i do remember like, that yeah. yep yeah and then the eagles came back and won it but it's just how it's it's always close race between uh, those teams. Then the Giants are bad. The Giants are just bad. I don't know if they're b- better than the Redskins. I don't know. I it's pretty rough. I mean, I think they are, but I, you you can't tell me that there's not a timeline where the Redskins could beat the Giants. And then the Cowboys. I I want to say that they're just a, they're enough better that they could, but I could see a situation where the, the Redskins just beat them. But that being said. It's just only because of the division. The Redskins can't beat anyone outside their division. I agree with that, and I'm going to pick the Panthers to cover. I agree. Uh, I think this is a big old butt whooping. Uh, Another 1 o'clock game. This one could have been flexed to a later time, but it's the two hottest teams in the league in the San Francisco 49ers at 10-1 and and the Baltimore Ravens at 9-2. and The Ravens have been crushing their opponents lately. Uh, This is the first time in the modern era where – the Ravens are where a team, I need to double check this right now uh, to make sure, where the Ravens have won three straight games against uh, teams with winning records by at least 20 points, I think it is, or at least 15 points. It's something like that. It's the first time it's ever happened. They've been absolutely boat racing teams, and they're getting four and a half at home. Uh, I have a feeling the Niners are going to slip a little bit here. And by slip, I don't mean they're going to lose by 25, but I think they're going to lose by a touchdown to the Ravens, and Lamar Jackson continues his toward pace for the MVP award. Which, by the way, uh, you had mentioned that. I'd like to see the MVP award. This is what they do in hockey. They have an MVP award, and they have another award for the most outstanding player. Uh, I forget the name of it, but I kind of would like to see the NFL do that. And I know they do the Offensive Player of the Year and the MVP, but... I mean, come on, the MVP is always going to be a quarterback because the quarterback is always the most valuable player to a team. I'd like to see them kind of separate it. That's pretty trash right now. Uh, It is annoying seeing a quarterback win every year, even though there's players like Christian McCaffrey and Michael Thomas are doing incredible things for their teams. So where are you leaning on the game? Uh, For the game, I'm picking 49ers plus 4.5. Uh, we saw the 49ers keep close to the Redskins in their game because of inclement weather. Uh, for this game, it is expected to be torrential pouring, 100% chance of rain, uh, and one inch, is, one inch of rain is, is expected to be on the ground. I forget how long. So I am picking 49ers plus 4.5 with weather conditions in, in mind. I'm not even thinking about uh how this goes i just i i remembered how the 49ers struggled in the in the rain against the redskins i think that uh i i think that that'll happen i think the ravens might slow down because of that as well definitely should play a factor in the game now moving to four o'clock games we got three on the slate first we got rams and cardinals uh the rams are at six and five they got the win on sunday night last week but man that offense still struggling mightily and the cardinals at three seven and one they're still competitive yeah, I got to pick the Cardinals plus three and a half. This division keeps it close always. And I just don't like the Rams team at the moment. They're just not very good. They're like really reeling at the moment. I'm going to pick the Cardinals to continue that downfall. 
Yeah, I don't really like the Rams either, but I'm I guess I'm kind of just going for broke and hoping I have a really good week here. I'll take the Rams to cover, but I'm not feeling good about that team at all. Jared that contract for Jared Goff looks like a massive mistake. Oh yeah. I still say it. I say that Sean McVay was like a one year wonder that no one was able to catch on in the first year, but after the first year it was just it wasn't new, it wasn't it wasn't new anymore. It was just now teams knew how to beat it. It was a system quarterback and the system's been hacked, we'll call it. So, uh, I just I, I I wasn't a fan of them coming into this year. Chargers at Broncos. The Broncos are two and a half point underdogs at home to the Chargers. The Broncos won the game in LA earlier this year. I'm going to take the Broncos uh, plus the two and a half here. I think they'll uh, pick up their the season sweep of the LA Chargers here. Oof! You're betting on Drew Lock. I can't. I was going to do it. I was I was thinking about it, and then I remembered because. The Broncos and Chargers both activated players for this game. The Broncos activated Drew Locke, and then the Chargers activated Adrian Phillips and Derwin James. And for me, uh, I had the Broncos plus two and a half at first, and then I was like, no, Derwin James is just such a uh, game changer that I can't. Uh, the, the Broncos are going to be starting a rookie quarterback, and that's a safety that was an all-pro safety in his first year. So I will be taking the Chargers to cover. That's a much smarter pick, but Drew Locke about to unload some deep balls right into the arms of defenders. It's about to happen. Book it. <laughs> you weren't high on him uh, going into this year, right? Like Bortles. Version 2. That's what I thought. Uh, another AFC West matchup, the Raiders at the Chiefs. Uh, this is actually a really important game right now. The Raiders are just one game behind. I would not have expected that given the way the first matchup went where the Chiefs scored four touchdowns in the second quarter, but uh, here we are now. It's uh, it's a game again. The Chiefs are getting nine and a half at home. Just a lot of points, to be honest. So I had to pick the Raiders plus nine and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, I figured the Raiders were going to play better. And you know what's crazy to think about? If Antonio Brown wasn't the way he was, the Raiders actually would probably be a really, really good team. Like that, that, like that's it. Like they're stuck with Antonio Brown's. Uh, no, they're not stuck with any of Antonio Brown's contract. I'm sorry. Let me re- uh, re-say that. Uh, if they had Antonio Brown, they would be a better team, which is kind of crazy, and they would have a much better chance at winning this game, it's, and they might have a better record because of it. It's too bad Antonio Brown is uh, the way he is. Otherwise, the Raiders would be Raiders would probably be better. Hundred percent. They've been a really good team this year. They've surprised a lot of people, and I think that they'll keep this one close. So give me the Raiders plus nine and a half as well. Sunday night football: Patriots at Texans. The Texans are three and a half point underdogs at home. The Patriots have won the last two matchups in this series, but they've both been in Foxborough. Where are you leaning? I'm leaning towards the Patriots. I their offense hasn't been good, but I, I the Texans haven't really. Well, me as a late either. So I'm going to pick the Patriots cover because their defense is just so good. How about you? Yeah, uh, all AFC South teams are really Pandora's box. I know you were mentioning that with the Titans, but really all the AFC South teams are like that. I can't trust them at all. Give me the devil I know in the Patriots over the devil I don't know in the Texans to cover. Um, Monday Night Football, that'll just leave us with the Vikings and Seahawks. A pretty good game here on Monday night. Uh You've got the Vikings who uh, are nipping at the Packers' heels for a chance to lead the NFC North division while the Seahawks are trying to keep pace with the 49ers. Seattle's only getting two and a half at home, which tells you Vegas likes the Vikings' chances, which I think is interesting. Uh, uh, this is uh, These are two teams that currently have the fifth and sixth seed in the NFC, uh, respectively. Uh, I do think that Seattle's going to win. I think that Seattle's the better team. I'm still not the biggest fan of the Vikings. They've definitely gotten better as the years gotten on, and they've uh, they've kind of grown on me a little bit because Kirk Cousins has been playing better. But, I mean, let's look at it. It's Kirk Cousins on prime time against a winning team. That's that's basically a form for Seattle to blow them out. So I'm going to pick Seattle to cover. What do you got? I'm just going to flip the script just for whatever reason. I'm going to say that Kirk Cousins is finally going to come through with that big-time win. Against all odds, somehow he's going to come through with a big-time win, and I got no reason to believe that that's going to happen. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm facing a big deficit here. So this is this is either going to backfire big-time on me, this the picks this week, or, or you know, uh, maybe I'll actually make up some ground. Maybe I shouldn't, like, place my bets like this, but... 
Hey, what, what I mean, can you do? I guess I'm desperate. It's kind of hard. You're not super... F I, I forget the actual statistics. I think I'm super 10. Far behind it's like 10. Three, yeah, with a th yeah, only 10. So with four weeks to go, maybe it isn't best to start now. But I mean... I I, I, it's, it's too late. To it's too late now. It is too late. <laughs> Here we Dang. go now. So, okay. Uh, that wraps up our picks for week 13. Let's get in, into some quick news. Uh, first, Ola Adini was fined 55 k for lowering his helmet into contact against the Bengals. You remember the play? Uh, I do not, but I just know that this is the second week in a row, and that's why it's so much money. He was fined 10 k for doing it against the Browns, and then he was fined 55 k for doing it against oh. the uh Oh, was it that Bengals. opening kickoff where he forced that fumble? That, that actually could have been a really dangerous play. I don't like how he ducked his head uh. like that. Maybe it was. Maybe it was now that you say that. But, uh, yeah. I just, it made me think, I'm so, sorry, but, like, it made me think about Ryan Chazier. Like, don't do that. Yeah, now, you shouldn't leave with your helmet. He's going to get hurt. He's done it two weeks in a row. And then, uh, second, you had uh, Mark Barron. He was named the NFLPA's Week 12 Community MVP for distributing 1,500 turkeys to underprivileged families in Alabama for Thanksgiving. Mark Barron, he's gotten a lot of crap this year, and he has struggled at times, but... Hey, that's uh, that's an A plus move and a classy act by a, a guy that knows what Thanksgiving is truly all about, and uh, we're thankful for him uh, this Thanksgiving. Yeah, at least he's giving back. At least he's a good person. That's all that really matters at the end of the day. So, uh, good for him for winning, uh, for doing that and winning that award. And uh, let's wrap up here with uh, a very bizarre story where free agent wide receiver Terrell Pryor uh, was stabbed earlier today. He was critically injured uh, after being stabbed with, uh, he was, what was it? He was stabbed in the shoulder and abdomen, uh, and a woman was charged with attempted homicide. So this is the article from ESPN. So a woman was charged with attempted homicide in Pittsburgh, a Pittsburgh stabbing the critically injured former Ohio State quarterback Terrell Pryor, who is also facing a charge. Pryor was taken to the hospital just after 4.30 a.m. following a dispute with multiple, multiple, Mutual combatants in an apartment sitting on the north side, police said. Pryor was stabbed in the chest and shoulder and underwent surgery. Uh, Allegheny County prosecutors said 24-year-old Sh Shalaya Briston of Munhall was charged with attempted homicide and aggravated assault, while Pryor, 30, faces a charge of simple assault. So, uh, my goodness. First of all, thank God everyone is you know in stable condition now, but what a bizarre story. Yeah, supposedly there was more details filled in. Uh, he and his, uh, the girl he was in a relationship with had gotten into an argument, and supposedly neighbors said that he's always been handsy with her, and he pushed her down, and it escalated. And uh, he that's why he got charged with, I think it's called simple assault? Yep. Uh, it's it, Yeah, simple. Okay. I couldn't remember the first term. And then uh, uh, she apparently it, it went into the kitchen, she got a knife, stabbed him, Quite a few times he was critical in the hospital. Now he's stable, but this is why uh, he has. Um, this is why he has charges now, and this would have been uh, fantastic had the Steelers signed him like two weeks ago, as he was like literally just begging for it. So um, yeah, this would have been a great story to have right before the uh, the Browns game. So yeah, maybe the Steelers knew what they were doing, I suppose. But just glad everyone is okay. I have one more NFL news. It's very important. <laughs> So uh, the New York Giants put oh Wong Sapper's Zach Diossi <laughs> on IR, and you know who they elevated? I know, I know, I know, but tell everyone. They elevated Colin Holba. Hall of Famer Colin Holba is back in the game, baby. Here he comes. I just had to point that out because Colin Holba is lit. So uh, just to give some context, because it has been now, what, three years since uh, the Steelers drafted long snapper Colin Holba? been quite a file so uh colin holba was a what a sixth round pick for the steelers in the 2017 nfl draft and uh you know not we weren't in favor of drafting a long snapper as i think uh, no one was in favor of drafting one and uh you know at the very least you could kind of forgive that if he has like a 15 year career like greg warren did where he you know you never really noticed him he did his job uh but yeah he lost his job to cameron canada uh, in his first training camp. So that was a draft pick well spent. And even if the draft pick was, you know, Keon Adams, who went later in that draft, even if it was a guy that just didn't really end up doing anything, I'd have rathered that, and I know you would agree with me. 
I would agree, but I, this is why Colin Hoba is the greatest of all time. Never forget, man. So we've been following his career pretty closely, but nice to see he's still playing because that, hey, if uh, Canada ever screws up, well, I guess uh, we could always just see what Colin is up to. Amen. Alrighty, with that note, let's wrap up this show. Uh, thank you, as always, for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Uh, if you have any questions about the show or about the Steelers, please feel free to email us at strongerthanstealpodcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, strongerthansteelnfl.blogspot.com to see our content. Uh, we post our videos on there uh, on YouTube, and we post the podcasts on SoundCloud as well. And uh, you can get all your Steelers-related news uh, and thoughts from uh, our website as well. And uh, you can check out all our social media there. Uh, Austin, thank you so much for joining me today. And a uh, big shout-out to John Gehring from 89.1 The Point for joining us again today. Always a pleasure to have him on the show. And uh, we hope everyone enjoys the game uh, tomorrow. And hopefully it's not, uh, you know, we're talking more about the game. And hopefully it's a Steelers win. But hopefully we're talking about the game and not so much about antics going on after the game. Sure hope so. I'm tired of antics and Twitter and all, all this stuff. Yeah, it really, it really has been, like we were saying, a black eye on the league. So hopefully this can move. we can move on and this can be a nice good example of what important important and high stakes football should be all about and not what we saw two weeks ago but uh, until next time thank you as always for listening to the stronger than steel podcast enjoy the game tomorrow and have a terrific day day you have been listening to stronger than steel podcast thank you for joining us today and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below